Good afternoon, folks. This is Somic. Uh, I'm the product manager at VMware for networking and cloud OpenStack integration. I was a co-founding member of uh, OpenStack Quantum Project. And I'm really glad that we have come to this stage today that we have real quantum users using quantum in production. Um, it's very heartwarming. And with that, I just wanted to thank our panelists for their taking the time out of their day and our moderator, Anil Lakhani from Gardner, for <laughs> for taking the time to moderate this panel. And I'll let them introduce themselves. And once again, thanks for coming. Hey, everyone. Uh, so this is a panel about people who are actually using quantum. That's these people here. Just out of curiosity, can we get a show of hands for the number of people here who are developers? People working on developing OpenStack? OK, users, people trying to implement. Uh, oh, look at that. All right. and. Uh, Vendors, people trying to sell something. Oh, oh, a fair number of those, too. OK. So what I'm going to do is have these people introduce themselves. Um, we'll talk about what they're doing with uh, quantum and go from there. Is there anybody here who doesn't know what quantum is? No? OK, so I can skip this one. Yeah? OK, good. All right, let's do some introductions. Uh, let's start with JC. Hi, um, I'm Jesse Martin. I'm from uh, eBay. Uh, I've been a cloud architect at eBay for the past five years. And uh, we've developed uh, our cloud um, based on OpenStack and uh, using Quantum um, for the past uh, maybe more than a year now. So we've been in production with this code for at least six months. OK. Jack? Yeah, so hi. <laughs> Jack McCann from HP Cloud Services. I'm the uh, technical lead for the engineering team that's bringing OpenStack networking into HP's public cloud. And this is not Mike. Hi, it's yourself. Hi, I'm Chad Norgan. I work at Rackspace on the public cloud, do um, basically our SDN and our cloud networking for public cloud. Mike was unable to make it. Um, that's Mike Eskelman, so Chad has gladly stepped in. Everyone give him a round of applause because he had no prep. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do is uh, go down the row, starting uh, eBay, then HP, then Rackspace, and ask you guys to describe uh, what it is that you're doing, particularly with Quantum. And I'll put up the slides that you sent me. Uh, so we'll start with eBay. OK, so um, in the diagram, there's two parts. Uh, the upper part is what a user is going to see. And the lower part is the implementation of how we are realizing what the user is um, exposed to. So on the top part, uh, you could imagine that what we call COS, class of service, is like a VPC in Amazon. And uh, we developed multiple of uh, those uh, VPCs that we allow uh, our users to share and create environments, virtual environments, which maps to uh, the um, OpenStack projects. So what we are using this for, so for example, we have one class of service, which is for developers. So every developer at eBay can get VMs in this VPC that they are all sharing together. They can get their own environment. They can define security groups for their VMs. And in addition, um, in the future uh, few weeks, um, we are going to allow them to create virtual networks, private networks in that environment. All the VMs in that class of service, or VPC, is sharing um, the same shared network, which is like a provider network, but it's a, a virtual network. And uh, we modified um, the scheduler in Nova so that based on the class of service that a user is, um, um, the project is part of a uh, class of service, and based on the project class of service, we can select which network each user has access to. And we created one for our um, developer uh, cloud, if you want, developer class of service. We are creating one for our um, public or external experimentation, so where people can have access to the internet. So each one of those VPC, if you want, uh, has different cap capabilities based on what network they have access to. So there's the virtual network that uh, is shared between all the VMs, but that virtual network is getting out on our uh, corporate network or on the internet. And based on the class of service that we defined, you, we filter out the traffic or we enable feature or disable features. So we, we created one like that for the developer, uh, one for experimentation that has full access to the internet from and to the internet. And uh, we, we can allow also other organizations in eBay because we have like many um, 
startups or um, groups that we acquired over the time that want to have their own isolated virtual private cloud. So we allow them to create this uh, environment for themselves and define what type of access or control they want to put for their uh, users. So that's, uh, if you want, a way for us to implement the, the equivalent of physical environments on top of a shared infrastructure. So all the infrastructure is the same below, but this allows us to replicate what people usually do with physical environments, where they have isolated networks with firewalls, and then they define policies like that. So that's a way for us to, to avoid having to do that. So in terms of implementation, we are using Nova, um, uh, the uh, Folsom version. We just upgraded last week, in fact. Uh, we are using Quantum, so the, the upgrade between SX and Folsom was kind of a forklift. We had to move the VMs manually. Um, then the Quantum is uh, using the NVP controller plugin, and uh, all the virtual networks are uh, from the VMware and NSX uh, product. Does anybody not know what NVP is? No, okay, I was just checking. Okay, so then uh, to go to the physical side of the network, we have a, a gateway that basically bridge virtual to physical networks. And uh, this uh, exits to a VLAN that exists only on those two, between those two devices. So in nowhere in our infrastructure we have VLANs. We have uh, kind of a, um, uh, a shared infrastructure that is based on uh, spine and leaf and uh, routed. So we, we just need VLANs between those two devices to uh, bridge between the physical and virtual. And then we have a firewall that controls what people can do at the edge of those virtual private clouds. All right. uh, Jack, tell us about what HP's got. Sure, so uh, next few minutes I just wanna go over and talk about what we've been doing with uh, Quantum and HP Cloud Services, why we've been doing what we're doing, um, talk about some of the key customer requirements that are driving those decisions, and then finish with a few thoughts on Quantum going forward. So in terms of what we've been doing, we've been looking at Quantum for about, uh, since the Diablo timeframe essentially, um, evaluating it, working with it internally. It's uh, certainly developed and evolved, lots of new code, lots of new features. A um, Couple important architectural shifts, uh, the V2 API and the incorporation of the IP address management functionality, that was important. Um, and I'm happy to see in Grizzly, it's finally reached a point of functional completeness where we can think about moving it forward into our production cloud. So what's driving our thinking around Quantum? It's basically the customer. What Quantum enables for us is a key use case. This, the key use case I see is private networks with overlapping IP addresses. And that's really what we've had customers asking for. And you wrap that up in the quantum API, provide a nice management plane for that. And it's really a good story, good story to tell. So in terms of the features that have been driving our thinking around quantum, I mentioned the basic two, private networks overlapping IPs. But there's another set of basic features that we currently offer in production. Um, Forgot to mention, our current production network is based on Nova Networking. Been running the flat DHCP model for about 18 months now in production. And there's a key set of features that we offer there that we needed to bring forward uh, into a quantum-based environment. So those would be security groups, floating IPs, uh, EC2 metadata support, and DHCP. And that all comes together in a picture that looks like this. And uh, I believe the quantum admin guide calls this uh, per tenant routers with private networks. And it all comes together in Grizzly very nicely. So that's sort of where we're at at the moment. Um, looking forward, there's certainly some nice new features coming in quantum uh, being talked about this week. VPN is an important one for us. Firewall load balancing as a service. Rounding out IPv6 support is gonna be important for us as well. Um, you know, I think, I think the projects team has really laid a strong foundation. They've built the house, the core of the house. People are ready to move in. Um, these new features will be nice addition to the house, but
but we've also got to make sure we maintain the foundation, maintain a strong foundation that's been built. So we'll have to keep an eye on quality, improve the API documentation, really nail the API specs, particularly around the extensions. And we've got to remember that we've got people living in the house now. So as we consider changes moving forward, we've really got to consider compatibility with the previous versions and provide an upgrade and migration path uh, as needed. So I'll wrap it up with that and hand it back to Anil. Hand it over to Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so our setup is pretty, pretty similar to eBay's in that we uh, basically for our, we use the Quantum with the Nicere MVP plugin. Uh, talks to the MVP controllers. All of our instances basically, we use a, a hybrid approach to our networking. We bridge the public network for their traffic in and out of the hypervisor to the internet or to our, what we call our service net to reach other Rackspace services. Um, and then we also, the big reason we wanted to deploy you know, SDN was to get overlay networks and to get customers the ability to set up their you know, own isolated networks because um, VLANs don't scale. There's, you know, obviously a big cap on how many you can put in there. Um, and then, you know, we came from a dedicated hosted business, so we have a, you know, tier one backbone, so we kind of want, we, we still can get, you know, ports very cheaply, and um, we find the hybrid approach is still working best for us right now. Um, in terms of uh, Quantum, we're still, we're on a, a forked version of Quantum, V1. Uh, we're working back to get into V2 or, something ahead of that. Um, we're, we kind of like the idea of quantum getting a little smarter and having data store. Um, but for right now, uh, that's pretty much our setup. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask a couple of questions and we'll discuss them and then I'll just open it up to everybody. So the first one is, can I grab one of these seats? Oh, sure. So the first one is, so what is quantum doing for you guys that you weren't getting before? Uh, what's your favorite thing about it, that sort of thing? So I have to say it's, uh, you know, the use cases that it enables for us and, and the features that it lets us offer our customers that I talked about, the private networks, the overlapping IPs, um, things that really our customers have been asking for. So from a service provider perspective, there's no way you were doing that before Quantum. No. <laughs> True. So in our case, uh, the main reason why we are using Quantum is to provide an abstraction on top of the capabilities of uh, SDN or overlay networks. Uh, we have a multi-vendor strategy at eBay, so today we are using Nisira, but maybe tomorrow we will uh, change providers. So we want to make sure that we have an abstraction on top of the features that we are relying on so that we can swap out the, the vendors um, as we require. And um, the, the key thing for us to use Quantum was the, the capability to automate the network provisioning. So one of the, the main thing that we tried to do uh, was to have end-to-end -end automation of our infrastructure. And the last mile that we could not automate was the creation of isolated networks. And uh, by using a combination of uh, overlay networks and quantum, we were able to completely automate the creation of networks up to the point of the configuration of the firewall, which happens only once. And then for every new network, it just plugs into the existing firewall configuration, so there's no manual intervention anymore. I mean, the big thing that's all for us is scale. Um, you have that layer there that you can do that automatic provisioning, we can you know, automate the pushing down of QoS settings. We can have, you know, an abstracted layer to where, you know, you can have very fixed, you know, things we're trying to achieve and then have quantum and actually worry about implementing that on the back end um, to where you don't have to have, you know, any, any you, you build it once and then from there the software takes care of all the provisioning. Okay, keep the mic. The next Correct. obvious question is what doesn't it do that you need it to do? One right now, I, I think our thing is it right now doesn't have a lot of state in itself. It is purely just an abstraction layer, and then it's always the plugin behind it that generally does the you know the complex. Line. We would like it to see you get a little smarter, maybe ha you know not have to reach back so much to the MVP controllers or to whatever is the backend store. Maybe have some of that knowledge you know right there at Quantum. So you want Quantum to be less of a framework and more of an executor. In between. Um, in between. Tell yeah. us more about in between. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Ready? It, it's, it's a big problem. Scaling this up. Yeah. 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 
uh, yeah, sorry, we ran into uh, scaling issues, and if, uh, like you said, if if Quantum didn't have to reach back into NVP as often, uh, it would be much more efficient for reads, which we do a lot of. And so that's that's one of the big things we like about moving forward to Quantum having a data store is a lot of the, the gits can be solved without having to reach back into your um, uh, vendor backend. So. So what was your question, the first one, first question again? <laughs> uh, so this question is, uh, what doesn't quantum do that you okay. needed to do? So we had to implement a few things on top of quantums that it doesn't do out of the box. Um, we did not implement it on quantum, but uh, on Nova. In fact, uh, the problem that we have is um, the network, it, they are not all equivalent. So, for example, when you create a public network in quantum, automatically the default policy is that your VM is going to get uh, a net, an interface on that network. But, uh, for example, if you have multiple layer two networks, you, for in our case, for one VPC, we might have up to 16 virtual networks. And uh, if they are all uh, shared public networks, your VMs are going to get 16 interface. So what we want to have is an abstraction of a network so that we can label it. So for example, shared network or public network or internet or whatever. And then quantum would do the allocation of the network based on capacity or some other policy, effectively implementing the same type of scheduler that you have in Nova for selecting an hypervisor. So we had to do that in the scheduler in Nova based on two things in our case. One was the class of service. So we have networks that are labeled with a class of service. So for example, in your case, you might have like a, a provider network and a private network, or you have like, a, in our case, a production network or a QA network, a dev network. So we want to be able to label them. And based on the class of service that the user um, comes in, we can select which network uh, they are uh, part of. So that was the main feature for us that was missing. And is that something you, as a participant in the community, are trying to drive into quantum? Uh, yes, uh, that's something that uh, we we talked to the the leads about, and um, we are looking at adding at least the label uh, in quantum. The the part that we do in the scheduler, we can still do in the Nova scheduler because there's a lot of context that you need in order to be able to do that. That is only available in Nova. When it reaches quantum, it's a bit too late. But there's some uh, resource allocation that quantum could do based on, for example, number of ports or number of IP availables in order to select the networks and be a bit more smart. So I think there's a project to have a scheduler in, in quantum um, coming up. So okay. that's the right direction. Right. Jack? Yeah, so I uh, realized I missed a point as uh, I was talking a little bit earlier um, around uh, our quantum deployment and uh, we've actually moved forward from an evaluation stage with quantum into a pre-production uh, type of testing environment and um, I was reminded uh, I don't think I mentioned the plugin that we're using it's an internal HP plugin that uh, has been developed in partnership with HP's research labs and HP's networking division um, so excuse me for backing up for a minute on that important point um, in terms of if I had to put my finger on one thing, um, I think the work around VPN as a service that's that's being proposed and worked on here in Havana um, is something that'll definitely benefit our customers, something they've been asking for. Okay, that's what I was gonna ask. So that's, are you getting demand for that from your customers as a service provider? Absolutely. Okay, okay great. So we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. We've got um, a mic stand here, so I think people are supposed to go to that to ask questions. So if you have a question, go ask it over there. It can't be the case that no one has a question. I, 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 know, I know more than a few of you in this audience. I know more than a few of you have trying to work some things out. So, Or we can just hand a mic around, too. So what is the role of the physical network uh, vendor in all this? I mean, you guys are overlaying interesting stuff on top. What do you want out of the physical network? Just transport, or do you want Right, so the question is, what is the role of the physical network here? 
Uh, anyone, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I have an answer. So uh, there's two parts in the physical network that we are running on. So the first one is, as you said, just a scalable transport with minimum latency. So that's why we optimized our network f to be scalable. And um, we ended up with an issue around isolation because when you have a very large network, like for example with 5,000, 10,000 nodes on the same uh, um, domain, then you need a way to uh, isolate, to create different type of uh, environments. So we, focus, we are focusing on optimizing our network for uh, bandwidth and latency. But uh, at the same time, we are looking at hardware vendors to help us uh, integrate bare metal machines, which we still have a lot, like for bare metal machines, like uh, uh, non-virtual machines, right? So it's the case, for example, of all appliances like NetApp uh, or load balancers or uh, this type of appliance, which could not run directly natively uh, yet uh, a virtual network. In the future with VXLAN, they might be able to participate in a virtual network, so that's an, op an opportunity. And also we are looking at uh, switch vendors to terminate the virtual network and bridge to their physical world. For example, when you want to have a multi-tenant backbone where, in our case, let's say that we have a, a PayPal or a, an eBay um, a domain in one data center and the same one in another data center. We want to preserve the isolation end-to-end. -end. So we need to be able to have this virtual network um, extended across the, the one entire, entire data centers, like for example using MPLS or something like that, and have end-to-end -end isolation for each tenant. But are, are you also saying that you want coordination between quantum and isolation mechanisms being used on the rest of the network? Right, so that, that's a place where this is going to get tricky because uh, either there's one controller that understands the virtual and the physical world and uh, then quantum would talk to that controller or there's multiple controllers that have to be coordinated to talk to the, uh, pr provide this end-to-end -end, um, architecture topology. Our, our big use of physical is a solid layer three fabric for the edge. Um, beyond that, I mean, most of all of the f fancy bits are on the edge, and then we kind of, yeah, just the layer three fabric. <laughs> yeah, I think um, primarily as a transport uh, is what we're doing with it now. But uh, I think one of the key things that quantum enables is, as JC pointed out, the ability to reach out and do some of that bare metal management down the road. So. That'll be important um, and really bring the two worlds together where a lot of the intelligence has been pushed to the edge right now. And we can start to move some of that and integrate it across the physical fabric. Anyone else? Yeah. So the first question was, how do you integrate quantum with naming servers, with DNS? And the second question, particularly for HP, was um, what's the thought process behind doing the virtual tenant routing? So let's start with the DNS. Has anybody? So in the case of DNS, there's two aspects of DNS. So are you referring to the um, names, the um, FQDN for the instance that are created? So in our case, we had to have um, a listener uh, which is also going to be replaced by the project called Moniker. There's a, a session this week about it. So it's basically listening to instance creation and instance deletion. And based on those, uh, we create the entries in our DNS. We have uh, already an automated uh, system that allows the configuration of the DNS entries. So we just invoke through uh, REST APIs this uh, service to create the, the entries re forward and reverse for each VM that we create. But by listening, to the, the events that Nova generates for instance creation and instance deletion. Yeah, it's real time. It, it, there's a, a, a slight um, delay, but um, it's almost real time. Yeah, and then at Rackspace, we basically put an API front end for our DNS infrastructure. So it's not automatic provisioning, but basically the customer is exposed an API in which they can provision uh, the DNS records programming. You know, we've got a uh, DNS as a service project underway that we'll be integrating with our quantum offering. Um, I believe 
so that's same. being discussed this yeah, week. That, that's, that, moniker. that's moniker, okay. for anybody who doesn't know that. Um, in terms of the question about the per-tenant routers, that's really get, gets back to the requirements that are driving some of our decisions there, and the key ones are the uh, private networks, overlapping IPs, and uh, the floating IP functionality. And all three of those really come together at that router uh, in front of the private networks. Let me ask you a follow-up question, because you mentioned IPv6, and you were the only person up here who mentioned IPv6. Why? We're starting to see demand for that. From your you know? customer side? Yeah. What about you guys? And that actually was one of the stronger reasons we also went to SDN, was actually we tried implementing it with the Linux bridging mm -hmm. and do manually answering our flows in our first generation cloud. Next gen, everyone, every instance gets its IPv6 at public address. Um, and the ability to have OpenFlow programmatically do all the router block or route announcement blocking and all of the protections on it was pretty much the only way we could safely implement it. Okay. JC, is IPv6 uh, important for you? Not at this point from the uh, internal uh, infrastructure. Um, on the external infrastructure, we are starting to implementing it, yes. But today, it's not um, uh, integrated with this architecture. Okay. More questions? Okay, so the question is about scale challenges, particularly with layer three services. So I'll, uh, I'll take a crack at that first. Um, I'll say essentially in both places, there's, there's challenges in the hypervisor, there's challenges in the physical fabric. <laughs> yeah, what, where, where exactly, where exactly did, did your implementation break? <laughs> Oh, uh, you mean when you say add in terms of versus an existing Nova-based environment, or just in general? Right? So, I yeah. mean, do you, have, do, you, do you have to add more capacity to be able to handle the load? So, I think in terms of the hypervisor, there's. Um, it's on par with what we see with our existing uh, Nova networking implementation um, in terms, of, I, I think, in terms of the physical fabric as well. Um, it's really not adding a whole lot more demand than what we're seeing right now with quantum. So for us, I think um, the quantum component itself doesn't add any challenges. It depends what network you are using behind it, right? Because um, depending if you are using VLAN or if you are using uh, overlay networks or some other technology, you will have different challenges. So if you are using overlay networks, um, when you go from the virtual to physical world, you have to go through a gateway, which is kind of a choke point. And uh, you have to design your networks in a way that you can scale that layer. And um, uh, the, the other limitation is, what, it's not really a limitation, but it's, there's a, uh, some additional management that you have to, to do is for every virtual network, you have to manage the number of ports that you can put on each network and uh, create new virtual network every time you reach the capacity in terms of ports, which is also something that you do f with physical networks. It, it's obvious, right? Because when you run out of ports on a switch, you use another switch. So it's the same concepts, or you line, uh, add a line card or something like that. So it's the same concept that you port in the virtual space. Same thing for the choke point, right? If you have a, like a router or uh, an edge device, it has a limited capacity. Maybe the, the scale today is better on physical device than it is on virtual uh, networks, but we will get there when the integration between virtual and physical happens. I'd say about the same. Um, the challenge for our scale has not been so much quantum as it's been the back end side in terms of, you know, MVP can only manage so many hypervisors or only so many OVS instances because it increases the complexity. And then there's only so many ports. It's, you know, more and more into that data store. Um, so we've been chasing pretty close with their development right as they release. We're kind of right up on the line um, constantly with them. 
Um, in terms of the layer three, that's why we've kind of attached, gone after the hybrid approach. We didn't feel right now that choking all of the virtual down to a couple of gateways, um, that we could adequately scale that for our entire cloud. So basically, you know, as soon as the VM, we get that packet, push it through the integration bridge, we put it back on the physical network and use kind of what we've learned in our dedicated hosting business. So. More questions? So the question is, uh, would the physical infrastructure actually understanding overlays solve some of these problems? I don't think it would solve much in our case. Uh, again, the overlay, you're, you're wanting to decouple your physical network or your virtual network from your physical network so that you can kind of you know, use whatever addressing scheme or whatever you know, layer three technology up. Um, beyond that, yeah. What about troubleshooting that? Troubleshooting is definitely, there's, you know, an overlay adds another layer. So you have all of, you know, the troubleshooting you would have had with the physical layers, you now have then the layer up. Um, NYSERA is at least nice in some of their dashboards and that you, you actually can step through that entire chain so you can, you know, do port checks between any two <laughs> virtual ports. And then we've kind of augmented and gathered a lot of stats and other things into Graphite to kind of find some of the other troubleshooting stuff. So to follow up on, on your question about hardware, so I mentioned, right, that th there is a choke point uh, in the gateway. And uh, if you can make your existing infrastructure terminate the tunnels instead of having this other device that is doing it, then you get basically line rate for your uh, transition between virtual and physical networks because you are reusing your existing distribution uh, tier, for example, or spine tier, right? So it's, uh, it's not that uh, there will be less components or less complexity because in those devices you will have like virtual routers which are terminating VXLine or STT tunnels and you still have to manage them and enter the, the MAC address in their tables and so on. But because those devices are optimized to do that a bit better than for example uh, an appliance, then uh, the, the goal would be to get um, parity with physical capabilities in terms of uh, throughput and, and latency. Yeah, I would agree with JC on that one. Anyone else? I think there was one over here. So the question is, is there a favorite protocol for this? I have, I have one, which is the most performant one. I mean, right right now, STT is giving us the most, we get hardware acceleration uh, with the TCB offload. So right now, STT is our overlay mechanism of choice right now. But as we kind of, you know, as we start seeing the the, the new chipset start supporting VXLAN, there's definitely a push that we could switch that out. It's purely a means to an end, um, the tunnel itself. We just look for performance. Yeah, it's really not about the format. It's it's about the function. And, uh, you know, watching, watching the... Uh, encapsulation wars over the last year or so, um, sort of waiting to see who's the winner that emerges. Um, VX line's not looking bad at the moment. <laughs> okay, um, we are out of time. Actually, we ran a little over, for which I apologize. Could everyone please give a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much.